Hello and welcome to our lecture on toothwear and implant considerations. My name is Carl Horton. I qualified from Birmingham University back in 1996. I had to think about that. I went into general practice, worked quite heavily in the NHS and also shared my time becoming an SHO at Birmingham University and a clinical lecturer also at Birmingham University with the undergraduates. Then went on into predominantly a private practice, became an honorary lecturer at UCLan on their implant MSc as well as a co-director for the VSS Academy at Birmingham and set up the Birmingham Horton Implants Referral Service. We run podcasts and that's enough about me. So let's talk a little bit about toothwear. So the etiology of toothwear comes in four forms that we understand. Attrition, abrasion, erosion and abfraction. With attrition being a stimulus or something from outside of the oral cavity such as a toothbrush. No, that's not true. Attrition is the tooth to tooth contact where the teeth are worn away. Abrasion is where we have something like a toothbrush or toothpaste or another foreign object that actually causes tooth tissue loss, erosion where we've got some chemical action and abfraction where we might get flexuring of the tooth and the loss of the cervical surface. So all of these are non-carious tooth surface loss and what we tend to find is that a lot of patients have a combined etiology and also the higher instance seems to be more towards erosion and attrition and we don't know sometimes whether our patients have a higher erosive content compared to their attrition content or whether their attrition is the larger factor and their erosive factor is smaller so that comes into our investigations and how we can help them out but it's usually a combined etiology so we need to understand how we can figure out what the the signs are and how we assess our patients and a lot of the patients that present to us have that have presenting with tooth wear have a parafunctional habit and we need to understand that so we look at the signs and the symptoms of these. So we're, we're looking at the joints, muscle tension, whether we get any clicking or crepitus, that kind of bubble wrap sound, changes to jaw freedom, limited opening, any locks, deviations in their movement. We're looking, when we're looking at the teeth, we're noting cracks and fractures on the restorations or cuspal fractures and when a patient presents with a, a fracture unless there's some kind of obvious information they provide to us like a bit on an olive or something similar if they are unaware of what's caused it then it may lead to us considering the fact that there is something else happening whether we've got loosening of the teeth phrenitis widening on the periodontal ligaments when we look at the radiographs again obvious signs of attrition the abfractions that we've mentioned whether we've got migration and mobility of teeth and then we ask them about symptoms so what's going on with the teeth and the joints are they getting any aches any pains how are these aches and pains presenting how are they manifesting and do they have that reduced freedom of jaw movement that we mentioned so we need to look at some kind of occlusal assessment 
we need an occlusal baseline. We need to make sure we examine the TMJ and that we examine and we record the occlusion. All these things need to be noted down. It's a medical legal requirement that they're in those notes so we can show that we've actually investigated these issues, detecting the TMJ or any dysfunction. And we need to look at what we're going to do to manage it and whether we're going to maintain a conformative approach or whether we're going to be comfortable undertaking a reorganized approach if that's what we feel is appropriate or do we refer. So we ask them about the symptoms, we ask about any previous TMJ treatment. We examine the TMJ with our fingers on the articulary and we're opening and getting them to open and close. We're watching how the jaw works. We're palpating the muscles, the medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid, the masseters. We have a look at the occlusion in maximum intercuspation and we have a look at the occlusion in excursive movements. So we're looking at working interferences, non-working interferences, and we're noting these down. And we're looking for signs of the occlusal disease, as we mentioned. So have we got any faceting anywhere? And sometimes we might look at the occlusion in center relation if we feel that's appropriate. It's been talked about in various papers and there are various ways of measuring and monitoring these. So I've just put these up there for information. So we've got the tooth wear index and the base of the erosive wear examination or the BWE. And then there was the Smith and Knight index. I, I find a lot of these for me tend to be more research based. I've put the paper there by um, Penny Bardsley down there and uh, what that sort of indicated and suggested is there's no sort of one defined or universal index that we use when it comes to measuring and monitoring tooth surface loss in this manner. Um, and it can be, these, these indexes can be a little bit time consuming, certainly when it comes to day-to-day -day practice. So for me, I, I don't find them that useful, um, but if you do want to search them up, that's absolutely fine. What I tend to find is that I'll record when I have a little look, the, the types of lesions that I'm seeing on the patients if they're present. So if we've got kind of holiday occlusal lesion, uh, lingual loss, you know, where, where it's present. I'll have a look at the extent and I, and I will define that as primary, moderate and severe. And there are, I've got this from other lecturers that I've seen. Um, and I find this is adequate enough for me. Um, I'll make a note of the, the patient's age when I'm thinking about this. And then a difficult one is compliance. So a lot of the patients that I see are referred in, in fact, all the patients that I now see are referred in, but in the past, when I was treating these patients, you know, they, they, are they gonna be compliant? Are they gonna to listen to the advice that we're gonna give them? Are they gonna wear the potential splints? You know, which, which is gonna be the best treatment based on their ability to attend the practice? Are they invested in, in what, you're, what you're suggesting? And this goes to the comes back to the implant patients as well. If they're not, if they're not going to invest in what you're suggesting and they're going to take on board what you're talking about, are you going to be looking after them? Is it is it wise to go down that implant path if your patients don't invest themselves into your proposed care? Because ultimately you are the clinician, and it's your responsibility to to make these decisions. So one of the things we do is study casts. Um, analog or digital, so I used to always be analog and get them orthodontically trimmed. Um, but now I have access to a oral scanner. So I'm, I'm scanning all the patients. Um, there are little bits of software on there that you can use to identify the patients when they're in occlusion. So this is this is not a replacement for a Facebook record, but it certainly can be useful. So you can see on the little image there, it's just identifying areas where there's sort of an increased occlusal load. So it grades it and you can 
modify that within the software parameters. So you can have a look at how close the teeth are coming together um, and review all the areas that you, you may be interested in. Um, and then some of these also have the ability to take the snapshot and re-record the patient. So if you are interested in whether the patient has active wear and you're losing occlusal vertical dimensions or other areas of the tooth, um, I mean, even to the fact that you can actually monitor the um, gingival line around your crown margins or implants, some patients are interested in that. And you can take your original scan, and then when you take a scan six months later, another six months down the line, there's actually the ability to compare the scans over time and use a timeline part of the software and play them against each other so you can see the differences. I, I find that quite useful and I think it's it's okay. As I said, it doesn't replace the Facebook record in terms of occlusal management, but it's 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 certainly an, an additional tool and maybe one day it will. So the differences between teeth and implants are essentially that teeth have a periodontal ligament and our implants are ankylosed into bone. So there is no periodontal ligament on an implant. But there is some, some ability for the bone to compress, but there's certainly a greater ability for the tooth to compress in its socket. We'll come back to that in a little bit. What I want to focus on here is sort of characteristics of occlusal forces. So when a patient has, when we're looking at occlusal forces, they're difficult to quantify. But if we look at normal function, a patient's chewing, we, we sort of have this short and very limited pressure. Whereas when we have a parafunctional patient, we're exceeding the physiological limits. And certainly it's for a much longer duration. And I've included sort of three studies here that you can have a look at that kind of show evidence of this and where they've tried to measure these things. And then Kim came along and had a look at the ranges of the mobility of a tooth compared to an integrated implant. So it goes back to our original diagram where we can see a difference between a tooth and an implant. So with a tooth, if we look at axial mobility, that's the force down the long axis of the tooth or the implant, we can see a tooth sort of has 25 to 100 microns. When you compare that to an implant, it's only three to five microns. So there's a very large difference between how an implant will respond to occlusal force compared to a tooth. And it's the same with lateral mobility as well. So with lateral mobility, no jiggling forces if you like, then a tooth certainly has a, a higher ability to move compared to an implant. And probably the best way to explain this to a patient is there's a, there's a sort of a tenfold difference in the ability when a patient's biting down on a tooth compared to an implant. They can still feel it, but their, their proprioception is sort of reduced tenfold when they have an implant in place. What about occlusal forces and the effects on osseo integration? Well, occlusal loading can be a factor that can lead to the failure of the implants whilst they're integrating. And there's evidence that, that does show that. This does lessen over time. So as the implant becomes integrated, then the risk of failure decreases. And then as we progress, sort of what we understand is that occlusal overload doesn't necessarily relate to loss of integration, but there is sort of some evidence out there and there have been cases reported where occlusal overload has possibly caused a loss of integration. Also in the presence of peri-implant disease, there is a thought that that is goes at an increased rate 
when we have occlusal overload on implants. So it's something to, to bear in mind. What about the effects on implants? Well, what we know about the fracture rates of implants is they're extremely low anyway, with or without occlusal forces being in there. So we get less than 0.7% over five years. That goes across the board. However, this study was taken back in 2007 and what it doesn't necessarily account for are the changes in alloys and designs which are changing all the time. So we have different alloys on implants. There is an implant that is mixed with titanium and zirconia with 15% zirconia and 85% titanium which certainly has a much stronger or gives a much stronger implant. You can alloy the implants. So if we look at the implants, they are grade four titanium if they're unalloyed. And then if we put aluminium and vanadium in these implants to increase this fracture resistance, if you like, then that is called a grade five implant. It depends on how you feel about your patients having aluminium and vanadium in their mouth as well. They're not probably pleasant products on their own. And then we have the um, cold worked titanium. And again, according to the, the manufacturers that has a 40% a increase in the fracture resistance of the implants. Designs, some implants come with a collar on the top um, and this collar essentially may lead to a, an increase in resistance to the forces that are applied down through the implant. So it, it moves the force potentially away from the connection compared to a what we call a bone level implant. So there are, there are some differences. There's also some internal differences, some internal connections um, and some internal designs, um, cone, morse taper, and the internal hex designs as well, which may help in distribution of the um, occlusal forces and, and reduce what they feel are some of the technical complications. So if we move on, we do get technical complications with implants. So rather than fracture of the actual implant itself or bone loss, what we tend to see is an increase in technical complications when we have occlusal overloads on our implants. So again, this relates to our patients with tooth wear. So we see an increase in, in certainly in screw loosening. We see an increase in the abutment failure or actual screw failure, so a fracture of a screw. We uh, see more debonding and we see an increase in fractures and chipping of the, the restorations. When we make a comparison, which Peterson did back in 2012, we can see the incidence of complications on implant restorations compared to restorations on teeth it is, is more than double. So we're looking at over five years at a complication rate of almost 40% compared to a tooth, which has a complication rate of about just 16%. So there's a, there's a huge difference between the two. So when we, when we talk about implants to our patients, we need to understand the level of these complication rates. So these implants, they're not, they're not going to, be something that is a one hit and then the patient can go away and everything's going to be hunky-dory. There's a 40% chance that we're going to get a problem with certain types of implant designs. So what, are, what do we do to reduce these issues? One of the things that we look at are axial loading or centered contacts. So if we have a look at this lovely little diagram here, we can see that we've got these areas certainly on the left where you have the implants and you have these centered contacts in the occlusal fossa 
And then if you have a look on the right, we've got that lovely old tripod that I'm sure you will achieve when you're doing your restorations. And then we're looking at a nice light contact on the on the canine. So there's there's a difference in the way that we design the occlusal contact and in static occlusion and I've brought the little table back up again if you remember the lateral forces then we have that issue with the implant and we look at flatter cusps slightly wider fossas and a decrease in lateral forces also we have something called gradial axle contact and there are, there's a little bit of AccuFilm here which I tend to use and a little bit of shim stock which just helps me identify the contacts. What I mean by gradial axle contacts is when it comes to shim stock there is a difference when you've placed your restoration in how we want the patient to occlude on that restoration. So what we look for when we place our restoration is the patient to bite together until they get that, that first light closure and then stay at that position. So we place the shim stock in between the teeth, ask them to, to gently bite together and then stay at that nice light position and then we attempt to pull the shim stock through. And what we should find is that when we've got tooth to tooth in that, that light firm closure, the shim stock holds. We then ask them to open, move the shim stock to our implant restoration. And if it's an implant against a tooth, in the same light first contact, the shim stock should just have a little bit of pull. So it should just pull through nice and gently. And then if it happens to be an implant opposing an implant, then the shim stock, we want that to pull through nice and easily. And then what we do is we ask the patient to bite together firmly. And what we should find again is that tooth to tooth, we get nice hold of the shim stock. And then as that tooth has been pushed into that periodontal ligament, we should then get the implant coming into play. And then we're getting hold on firm closure implant to tooth and implant to implant. So we're using that, that ability of the tooth to move into its socket or teeth to move into the socket and give us that hold. When we look at anterior implants, then we're using the adjacent teeth with the feedback to take the guidance. So slightly different. What we have here is an implant on the upper right two and what we're looking for is guidance so I'd also be using articulating paper in here I'll be asking the patient to do some excursive movements and I'll be looking for excursive movements on the canine which is a natural tooth and on the central which is a natural tooth to take the feedback where possible and I say where possible because it's not always possible in the posterior implants, we're looking for no lateral or non-working contacts on the implant prosthesis. So we want it all to be on the anterior area when they're working in the lateral contacts. So again, this comes back to our assessment. Have we got some anterior guidance present? If we are conforming and if we are reorganizing, do we need to create this? And if we do need to create it, how are we going to create it? So let's, let's have a little look at implant restorative space. So if we look at what Mish discussed, we, we look at a cementable abutment. This is where we have an abutment and the crown is cemented over the top. Then five millimeters is what we're looking for, for retention of an implant crown on the abutment. That's, that's kind of what is desired. The minimum abutment heights that are discussed are for a narrow platform implant, a minimum of three millimeters, and for a wider implant, four millimeter implant, four millimeters. And what's also been identified is if we increase 
the abutment height by two millimeters, then we get a 40% increase in the retention of our cemented cranes. So it, it's obvious it's the same when we look at teeth. The shorter and stubbier uh, crane prep is, then the less retention we have, and it's the same with the abutments. So the shorter the abutment, the less retention that we have. It's exactly the same principles. So when we're looking at a tooth wear patients, how much room do we have? And that comes on to the, the restorative space. So this varies depending on what type of restoration you're thinking about. But if we have a look at Carpentary and Kim, again, mentioned this, and so did Witt and Ben. So we're looking at the, the minimum amount of vertical space that we need to the opposing dentition from our proposed implant site. So for a fixed screw retained, then we're looking at four to five millimeters. For a, a fixed screw retained at the abutment level, this is where we might be doing um, a bridge or even a full arch bridge. We need about seven and a half millimeters for a fix, fixed cement retained, we need seven to eight millimeters. And then for an unsplinted overdenture, we need seven millimeters and a bar overdenture 11 millimeters and a fixed screw hybrid 15 millimeters. Doesn't mean you can't do it without these, this space, but it's gonna be complicated and we're going to probably run into more difficulties. So if we use this as a guideline for our minimum space, then this is gonna help reduce the issues that we talked about earlier on. So do we accept or do we intervene? Do we do, we do direct composites, indirect work? So what are the guidelines regarding tooth wear and parafunction with implants? Well, we look at additional implants. So rather than if we had a space placing one implant, we might consider two implants. We might consider wider implants rather than narrower implants to distribute the force. And we might consider splinting the implant restorations rather than having two cranes next to each other. We might distribute the load by splinting them. Now, this has to be weighed up so that the patient can clean the implants because that is a highly important factor. So the design, if we are splinting, has to be of such a design that the patient can adequately clean between those implants. And if they can't, then we, we may need to consider whether splinting is the right thing to do or not. We use conventional loading, so rather than putting the implant in and, and loading immediately, wait eight weeks, conventionally load. Uh, avoid patients that have tooth wear with uh, complex solutions. This is, can't always be noted because some patients turn up with um, complete dentures and we may not identify the fact that the patient has parafunction um, and we may end up providing a complex solution for the patient uh, and then once you put the fixed prosthesis in you suddenly identify their abruxa and they start smashing your implant to bits I don't know what you do as a solution to that it's a preference for a screw retained solution over a cemented solution because it's retrievable so if something does unfortunately happen and we do get a fracture on the restoration, then we can unscrew it rather than having to cut it off and send it to the lab, rescan or reimp and have a look at the occlusion and get it redesigned. Cantilevers, use them with caution. The increased length on the cantilever increases the fracture rate and depending on the length that you're going, uh, the further back you go and the further you cantilever, the more likely you are to increase stress into the situation. And in fact, one of the um, companies that, Createch, that are sort of an aeronautical company, so they are fantastically accurate and superb at helping design your implant components they will put a waiver on if you do start doing cantilevers that they will take no responsibility to anything that happens with their structures. So if they're worried, then I think you probably need to be worried when you're gonna consider cantilevers. And then consider a protective splint. What do I mean by protective splint? 
Well, here's a picture of one here. This, if you've identified the patient has parafunction, which these toothwear cases predominantly have, then we provide them with the hard acrylic occlusal guard. And what we do is we put that into mutually protective. So posterior stops, and then we've got a occlusion when they're biting together. And then as they move forward into their excursions, the posteriors disclude. So as they're biting together, then in Mactamids, and then review it. So summarize teeth diff to implants regarding the occlusal forces. There's a limitation to the vertical space that we can work with when it comes to implants. The technical complication with implant restorations are certainly higher compared to teeth as a result of the occlusal forces. There is a specific favorable design to implant restorations that increases the success rates and reduces the issues when it comes to occlusion and implant occlusal schemes. They need regular monitoring and mentoring. Uh, thank you very much for your time.